Chapter Six of the Lamplighter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter Six. Some scream that they can silence when they will the storm of passion and say, "Peace, be still." Cowper. Here, True was interrupted. Quick, noisy footsteps in the passage were followed by a sudden and unceremonious opening of the door. Here, Uncle True said, "The newcomer." Here's your package. You forgot all about it, I guess, and I forgot it too, till mother saw it on the table where I'd laid it down. I was so taken up with just coming home, you know. Of course, of course, said True. Much obliged to you, Willie, for fetchin' it for me. It's pretty brittle stuff it's made of, and most like I should have smashed it fore I got it home. What is it? I've been wondering. Why, it's a little knick-knack I brought home for Gertie. Here, that. Willie, Willie! Called Mrs. Sullivan from the opposite room. Have you been to tea, dear? No, indeed, mother. Have you? Why, yes, but I'll get you some. No, no, said True. Stay and take tea with us, Willie. Take tea here, my boy. My little Gertie is makin' some famous toast, and I'll put the tea as steep in presently. So I will, said Willie. I should like to first rate. No matter about any supper for me, mother. I'm going to have my tea here with Uncle True. Come now, let's see what's in the bundle. But first, I want to see little Gertie. Mother's been telling me about her. Where is she? Has she got well? She's been very sick, hasn't she? Oh, yes, she's nicely now, said True. Here, Gertie, look here. Why, where is she? There she is, hiding up behind the settle, said Willie, laughing. She ain't afraid of me, is she? Well, I didn't know as she was shy, said True. You silly little girl, added he, going towards her. Come out here and see Willie. This is Willie Sullivan. I don't want to see him, said Gertie. Don't want to see Willie, said True. Why, you don't even know what you're sayin'. Willie's the best boy that ever was. I spect you and he'll be great friends by and by. He won't like me, said Gertie. I know he won't. Why shan't I like you? said Willie, approaching the corner where Gertie had hid herself. Her face was covered with her hands, according to her usual fashion when anything distressed her. I guess I shall like you first rate when I see you. He stooped down as he spoke, for he was much taller than Gertie, and taking her hands directly down from her face, and holding them tight in his own, he fixed his eyes full upon her, and, nodding pleasantly, said, How do you do, cousin Gertie? How do you do? I ain't your cousin, said Gertie. Yes, you are, said Willie, decidedly. Uncle True's your uncle, and mine too, so we're cousins, don't you see? And I want to get acquainted. Gertie could not resist Willie's good natured words and manner. She suffered him to draw her out of the corner and towards the lighter end of the room. As she came near the lamp, she tried to free her hands in order to cover her face up again. But Willie would not let her, and, attracting her attention to the unopened package and exciting her curiosity as to what it might contain, he succeeded in diverting her thoughts from herself, so that in a few minutes she seemed quite at her ease. There, Uncle True says it's for you, said Willie. And I can't think what tis. Can you? Feel, it's hard as can be. Gertie felt, and looked up wonderingly in True's face. Undo it, Willie, said True. Willie produced a knife, got the string, took off the paper, and disclosed one of those white plaster images, so familiar to every one, representing the little Samuel in an attitude of devotion. Oh, how pretty! exclaimed Gertie, full of delight. Why didn't I think? said Willie. I might have known what twas by the feeling. Why, did you ever see it before? said Gertie. Not the same one, but I've seen lots just like it. Have you? said Gertie. I never did. I think it's the beautifulest thing that ever was. Uncle True, did you say it was for me? Where did you get it? It was by an accident I got it. A few minutes before I met you, Willie, I was stopping at the corner to light my lamp, when I saw one of those furrin boys with a sight of these sort of things. And some black ones, too, all set up on a board, and he was walkin' with them atop of his head. I was just a wonderin' how he kept em there, when he hit the board agin my lamp post, and the first thing I knew, whack, they all went. He'd spilt em every one. Lucky enough for him, there was a great bank of soft snow close to the sidewalk, and the most of em fell into that, and wasn't hurt. Some few went on to the bricks, and were smashed. Well, I kind o' pitied the feller, for it was late. And I thought like enough he hadn't had much luck sellin' of em 
to have so many left on his hands. "'On his head, you mean,' said Willie. "'Yes, Master Willie, or on the snow,' said True. "'Anyway, you're a mind to have it.' "'And I know what you did, Uncle True, just as well as if I'd seen you,' said Willie. "'You set your ladder and lantern right down, and went to work helping him pick em all up. "'That's just what you'd be sure to do for anybody. "'I hope, if ever you get into trouble, some of the folks you've helped will be by to make return.' "'This feller, Willie, didn't wait for me to get into trouble. "'He made return right off. "'When they were all set right, he bowed and scraped and touched his hat to me, "'as if I'd been the biggest gentleman in the land. "'Talkin' too he was all the time, though I couldn't make out a word of his lingo. "'And then he insisted on my takin' one of the figures. "'I wasn't a-goin' to, for I didn't want it, "'but I happened to think little Gertie might like it. "'Oh, I shall like it,' said Gertie. "'I shall like it better than—' "'No, not better, but almost as well as my kitten. "'Not quite as well, because that was alive, and this isn't. "'But almost. Oh, ain't he a cunning little boy?' "'True, finding that Gertie was wholly taken up with the image, "'walked away and began to get the tea, "'leaving the two children to entertain each other. "'You must take care and not break it, Gertie,' said Willie. "'We had a Samuel once just like it in the shop, "'and I dropped it out of my hand onto the counter.' "'and broke it into a million pieces. "'What did you call it?' said Gertie. "'A Samuel. They're all Samuels.' "'What are Samuels?' said Gertie. "'Why, that's the name of the child they're taken for.' "'What do you suppose he's sitting on his knee for?' "'Willie laughed. "'Why, don't you know?' said he. "'No,' said Gertie. "'What is he?' "'He's praying,' said Willie. "'Is that what he's got his eyes turned up for, too?' "'Yes, of course. He looks up to heaven when he prays.' "'Up to where?' "'To heaven.' Gertie looked up at the ceiling, in the direction in which the eyes were turned, then at the figure. She seemed very much dissatisfied and puzzled. "'Why, Gertie,' said Willie, "'I shouldn't think you knew what praying was.' "'I don't,' said Gertie. "'Tell me.' "'Don't you ever pray? Pray to God?' "'No, I don't. Who is God? Where is God?' Willie looked inexpressibly shocked at Gertie's ignorance, and answered, reverently, "'God is in heaven, Gertie.' "'I don't know where that is,' said Gertie. "'I believe I don't know nothing about it.' "'I shouldn't think you did,' said Willie. "'I believe heaven is up in the sky. "'But my Sunday-school teacher says heaven is anywhere goodness is, "'or some such thing,' he said. "'Are the stars in heaven?' said Gertie. "'They look so, don't they?' said Willie. "'They're in the sky, where I always used to think heaven was.' "'I should like to go to heaven,' said Gertie. "'Perhaps if you're good, you will go some time.' "'Can't any but good folks go?' "'No.' "'Then I can't ever go,' said Gertie, mournfully. "'Why not?' said Willie. "'Ain't you good?' "'Oh, no, I'm very bad.' "'What a queer child,' said Willie. "'What makes you think yourself so very bad?' "'Oh, I am,' said Gertie, in a very sad tone. "'I'm the worst of all. "'I'm the worst child in the world.' "'Who told you so?' "'Everybody.' "'Nan Grant says so, and she says everybody thinks so. "'I know it, too, myself. "'Is Nan Grant the cross old woman you used to live with?' "'Yes. How did you know she was cross?' "'Oh, my mother's been telling me about her. "'Well, I want to know if she didn't send you to school or teach you anything.' "'Gertie shook her head. "'Why, what lots you've got to learn. "'What did you used to do when you lived there?' "'Nothing. "'Never did anything, and don't know anything. "'My gracious!' "'Yes, I do know one thing,' said Gertie. "'I know how to toast bread. Your mother taught me. She let me toast some by her fire.' As she spoke, she thought of her own neglected toast, and turned towards the stove. But she was too late. The toast was made, the supper ready, and True was just putting it on the table. "'Oh, Uncle True,' said she, "'I meant to get the tea.' "'I know it,' said True. "'But it's no matter. You can get it to-morrow.' The tears came into Gertie's eyes. She looked very much disappointed, but said nothing. They all sat down to supper. Willie put the Samuel in the middle of the table for a center ornament, and told so many funny stories, and said so many pleasant things, that Gertie laughed heartily, forgot that she did not make the toast herself, forgot her sadness, her shyness, even her ugliness and wickedness, and showed herself, for once, a merry child. After tea, she sat beside Willie on the great settle, and in her peculiar way, and with many odd expressions and remarks, gave him a description of her life at Nan Grant's, winding up with a touching account of the death of her kitten. 
The two children seemed in a fair way to become as good friends as True could possibly wish. True himself sat on the opposite side of the stove, smoking his pipe, his elbows on his knees, his eyes bent on the children, and his ears drinking in all their conversation. He was no restraint upon them. So simple-hearted and sympathizing a being, so ready to be amused and pleased, so slow to blame or disapprove, could never be any check upon the gaiety or freedom of the youngest, most careless spirit. He laughed when they laughed, seemed soberly satisfied, and took long whiffs at his pipe, when they talked quietly and sedately, ceased smoking entirely, letting his pipe rest on his knee, and secretly wiping away a tear when Gertie recounted her childish griefs. He had heard the story before, and he cried then. He often heard it afterwards, but never without crying. After Gertie had closed her tale of sorrows, which was frequently interrupted by Willie's ejaculations of condolence or pity, she sat for a moment without speaking. Then, becoming excited, as her ungoverned and easily roused nature dwelt upon its wrongs, she burst forth in a very different tone from that in which she had been speaking, and commenced uttering the most bitter invectives against Nan Grant, making use of many a rough and coarse term, such as she had been accustomed to hear used by the ill-bred people with whom she had lived. The child's language expressed unmitigated hatred, and even a hope of future revenge. True looked worried and troubled at hearing her talk so angrily. Since he brought her home, he had never witnessed such a display of temper, and had fondly believed that she would always be as quiet and gentle as during her illness and the few weeks subsequent to it. True's own disposition was so placid, amiable, and forgiving, that he could not imagine that any one— and especially a little child, should long retain feelings of anger and bitterness. Gertie had shown herself so mild and patient since she had been with him, so submissive to his wishes, so anxious even to forestall them, that it had never occurred to him to dread any difficulty in the management of the child. Now, however, as he observed her flashing eyes, and noticed the doubling of her little fist, as she menaced Nan with her future wrath, he had an undefined, half-formed presentiment of coming trouble in the control of his little charge, a feeling almost of alarm, lest he had undertaken what he could never perform. For the moment she ceased, in his eyes, to be the pet and plaything he had hitherto considered her. He saw in her something which needed a check, and felt himself unfit to apply it. And no wonder, he was totally unfit to cope with a spirit like Gertie's. It was true he possessed over her one mighty influence, her strong affection for him, which he could not doubt. It was that which made her so submissive and patient in her sickness, so grateful for his care and kindness, so anxious to do something in return. It was that deep love for her first friend, which never wavering, and growing stronger to the last, proved in after years a noble motive for exertion, a worthy incentive to virtue. It was that love, fortified and illumined by a higher light, which came in time to sanctify it, that gave her, while yet a mere girl, a woman's courage, a woman's strength of heart and self-denial. It was that which cheered the old man's latter years, and shed joy on his dying bed. But for the present it was not enough. The kindness she had received for the few weeks past had completely softened Gertie's heart toward her benefactors. But the effect of eight years' mismanagement, ill-treatment, and want of all judicious discipline, could not be done away in that short time. Her unruly nature could not be so suddenly quelled, her better capabilities called into action. The plant that for years has been growing distorted, and dwelling in a barren spot, deprived of life and nourishment, withered in its leaves and blighted in its fruit, cannot at once recover from so cruel a blast. Transplanted to another soil, it must be directed in the right course, nourished with care and warmed with heaven's light ere it can recover from the shock occasioned by its early neglect and find strength to expand its flowers and ripen its fruit so with little gertie a new direction must be given to her ideas new nourishment to her mind new light to her soul ere the higher purposes for which she was created could be accomplished in her something of this true felt and it troubled him he did not however attempt to check the child he did not know what to do, and so did nothing. Willie tried once or twice to stop the current of her abusive language, but soon desisted, for she did not pay the least attention to him. He could not help smiling at her childish wrath, nor could he resist sympathizing with her in a degree, and almost wishing he could have a brush with Nan himself, 
and express his opinion of her character in one or two hard knocks. But he had been well brought up by his gentle mother, was conscious that Gertie was exhibiting a very hot temper, and began to understand what made everybody think her so bad. After Gertie had railed about Nan a little while, she stopped of her own accord, though an unpleasant look remained on her countenance, one of her old looks that it was a pity should return, but which always did when she got into a passion. It soon passed away, however, and when, a little later in the evening, Mrs. Sullivan appeared at the door, Gertie looked bright and happy, listened with evident delight, while True uttered warm expressions of thanks for the labor which had been undertaken in his behalf, and, when Willie went away with his mother, said her good night, and asked him to come again so pleasantly, and her eyes looked so bright as she stood holding on to True's hand in the doorway, that Willie said, as soon as they were out of hearing, "'She's a queer little thing, ain't she, mother? But I kind of like her.'" End of chapter 6